My name is Ruben Acosta. I work with the State Historic Preservation Office in Lincoln, so just an hour down the road. Um, and I am the National Register Coordinator, as well as the Coordinator for the Certified Local Governments Program, which is a partnership between the federal, state, and local governments in promoting uh, historic preservation. So today I am going to be doing a very brief introduction to evaluating historic significance to determine if buildings are, you know, historic according to a set of standards um, used by the federal government, by the state government, and by local historic preservation commissions. So when we look at buildings, right, People see different things in buildings architecturally. They know different stories about them. So it leads to a lot of different interpretations over whether a building is historic or not, right? Because people have different ideas of what history is. And objectively as well, I mean, history is not just the past, right? It's not just the facts, it's how those, um, uh, how that information from the past survives to this day and is interpreted. So it leads to a lot of discussions, and history does change over time. So a set of standards was developed in order to help look at buildings objectively to understand their importance so that you have a building like this, the Storrs House here in Omaha, compared to a structure like this. This is the Plainview Bandstand shell um, further in western Nebraska, and then evaluating a building like this. This is the uh, Holdridge um, Railroad Depot, the CB&Q Railroad Depot out there. And even spaces like this, the uh, Parks and Boulevard system here in Omaha. So my work is primarily with the National Register of Historic Places, which is the great big list of historic places in the United States, which is administered by the National Park Service and the State Historic Preservation Offices work to list properties on that master list um, and includes buildings, structures, sites, objects. I mean, we've got railroad locomotives, parks, cemeteries, houses, factories, you name it, and we could probably find an example on the list. So the list will turn 50 years old next year, essentially, because it was created by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Um, it incorporates properties that had been deemed historic before then. There were previous laws in order to designate properties on, uh, as uh, historic monuments and such, and those can go as far back as the 1930s. But in terms of you know, widespread preservation activities at both the federal and state level. It only dates to the 1960s. And that's a result of the change that occurs in the United States following the Second World War and the prosperity that occurs, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, when everybody wanted new, 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 new. They wanted interstate highways. They wanted new public buildings. And what that meant was getting rid of a lot of old buildings. Um, and it led to the loss of a lot of monuments. You know, this is essentially the catalyst building for the modern preservation movement. This was the old Pennsylvania Railroad Station in New York City, located right there in Midtown. Um, it dates to the 19-teens at the height of the railroad's power, and it was like ancient Roman architecture. You walked in and the waiting room's 130 feet tall, and it's this huge cavernous space. But by the 1960s, it was underutilized, and the costs to maintain the space were astronomical. And what happens, the railroad sells their air rights over the railroad tracks, and they tear this building down completely. Uh, what's there now is Madison Square Garden. So if you've ever been to New York City and you go see a sports game right there in Midtown, you're over the old Pennsylvania Railroad Station. And that led to a movement, not only in New York City, but across the country to recognize historic monuments, historic buildings, and to preserve them. But it wasn't limited to buildings just like this. It was to try to preserve historic neighborhoods and um, you know, communities because entire towns were being eliminated by highway construction and other federally funded projects. So that's why they passed this law and established the National Register. When they established the National Register, they had to establish 
a system so that they could objectively understand and look at buildings. And so the first thing was is to determine what type of information did they need and then a set of standards that they could apply to that information so that they can make a determination as to whether a building had significance. So what type of information is necessary? Well, we look at lots of different things, historic photographs, census records, city directories. We want to try to find out much, as much about the building and the people who lived and worked there as possible so that we can understand its full story and place it within a larger local, state, or even national context. So here you can see you know, historic photographs, census records, fire insurance maps you know, back in the early 20th century when they were calculating insurance values. They had to know what buildings were made out of, where they were located. And so we have these great resources. This is on Farnham Street in the middle of Automobile Row where we can see what businesses were located and what buildings and what the buildings were made out of and how tall they were. And we collect all of that information so that we can then move on to the actual criteria that we use to make this determination. And we look at three broad categories. We're looking for age, we're looking for significance, and we're looking for integrity. Age is pretty simple. Buildings should be at least 50 years old for us to even start looking as to whether they're historic or not, because we need to have, um, Well, we need, well, while that's working, I'll explain this. We need to have perspective, right? People need to evaluate context, and that takes time. So the federal government and the National Park Service, when the historians were putting these programs together back in the 1960s, decided that 50 years would be roughly you know, enough to start making determinations as to the significance of buildings. The second major criteria is significance itself, and it's essentially what is the building's story? What does it tell us about the past? All right, and that can fall into four criteria. All right, there's an association with specific events, uh, for example, the founding of a town, or the establishment of a business, or a speech by a major political leader. Those are all events that can give a building significance. There's association with a historically significant individual. For example, if there was a house where a major politician ran his campaigns out of that house over a period of years, that can give a building significance. Or if it was a home for a doctor or a major businessman, those can all give significance via association with a historically significant person. The third category is association with significant architecture. And that's where most buildings fall under, and it's either a building that is significant by itself. It's an example of a masterwork. You know, they got Philip Johnson to come out here to the plains and design them a glass house or something, right? And that would make that building significant under architecture. But it also includes representative types of architecture. We could have a very good example of, let's say, a Queen Anne Victorian house with spindlework decoration and such and such, and that could be a good representative example that lets us you know, make determinations about its time period, and that would be enough for it to be listed and deemed historic. The fourth category is archaeological potential, the, the potential to find out more information about the past sometime in the future as we develop better technology and recording efforts. And that only really applies if your building was like wiped out by a tornado and all that's left is a foundation that's been that way for 50 years or something like that, or a Native American site. So if you've got you know, a Pawnee village in your backyard, then maybe we can do a listing under criteria D. The last major criteria, so we've had age, we have significance, is integrity. A building may be old. A building may have a story to tell, but that's not enough. A building has to be able to tell its story by preserving key characteristics of its design from the time period that it was significant, from the time period when it developed its story. And we look at things like its location, its setting, does it preserve its original materials? Can you see the workmanship of the people who built the building? Does it feel historic, right? 
And so some of those criteria are quite concrete. Like you can tell, yeah, that's 1910 wood on your, that you have for siding. And then some of them are kind of abstract, that feeling. Oh, do it, you know, this looks and feels old. So you need to have all of those criteria in order to be deemed historic, you know, under the criteria that were established so that, you know, everybody could come to a consensus. So now we get to the point where I really <laughs> would need photos. Uh, because I wanted to show some examples under the three major criteria for significance and then some examples for integrity before we wrap this up. Um, just so that you can have you know, a, a, a visual appreciation for what I'm talking about. And also I wanted to show you examples that aren't those monuments like the store's house or like, you know, uh, right next to here, we have the old um, stock exchange building for the Union Stockyards. You know, that's a big monumental structure. I wanted to show some other buildings that, you know, you may think, oh, well, ah, I mean, how does that fit in? And, and to try to explain it through. Yeah. Sure, I can take it. Yes, yes, that actually happens all the time. Um, so the, the question was, so the question was, are there instances where a building may have historic significance, but it's not able to be listed because of remodeling or later changes? And that it happens more often than I, I, I wish, um, where we have a historic building, and we'll see an example of a historic building that has been changed within the last 50 years. And the changes have affected it so much that it has lost integrity. And therefore, we are unable to list the property. Um, a lot of times, that's because of a loss of materials. So we are unable to see um, the historic materials. Or there's a change in the design of the building. Where my favorite analogy is, is that when I'm trying to list a building, I should be able to go back in time kidnap somebody who lived or worked there, bring them forward in time, show them the building, ask them if they recognize it. And if they say yes, then I boot them back to the past, and then I move forwards with the listing. Um, so we'll see a, a, an example um, here of a, of a property where we had to do a determination of eligibility. All right, so too far forwards. Okay. All right, so. All right, so we had the criteria, and now the pictures, yay. So, first criteria, events. So direct association with events is what we're looking for. It can't be representative of an event. We have to establish a direct connection with an event or a pattern of events over a period of time. So for example, we have this building. This is located here in Omaha. I believe it's South 13th Street. This is the old Prague Hotel. This is listed on the National Register of Historic Places for its association with historic events, specifically the pattern of Czech immigration to Nebraska and specifically to Omaha. And that's where this building gains its significance because it was essentially an immigrant hotel that catered specifically to Czech immigrants arriving to this region who would either stay here in Omaha or they would then move on to the west to stake homestead claims or buy land from the railroads. So this is an example of criteria A. And I'm trying, uh, when I put these pictures together, I tried to find as pure examples of these as I could. So, you know, um, we do have the ability to list properties under multiple criteria. So a property can be associated with events and architecture or events and people and so on. So don't think that these criteria you know, you can only fit into one, you can fit into multiples. Um, another property, so this is the old mill up in Florence, if I remember correctly. Uh, another building, this is associated with industrial history and the development of industry in Nebraska. This is one of the oldest uh, mills in the state. And it is on the National Register because it manages to pre preserve its design and construction. You can really tell the industrial history by visiting and taking a look around this building. Something a little different 
is this. All right, they don't look like much, but these are the Traver Brothers uh, row houses or apartments here in Omaha. Not really architecture, of course, but the significance is not its appearance, but it's um, the story of how it came to be. This is listed as under criteria A for its role in community planning and development, essentially the growth of Omaha and how the city changed to accommodate its increasing population in the early 20th century. And this is an interesting property because we have all of these buildings, but when you look at it, their significance comes out of their organization, right? Where the property owners put together several city lots and they essentially created this neat little neighborhood for their apartments that you can see um, on the aerial photograph on the right. And then to the left, we have a historic Sanborn fire insurance map. And you can see the original organization and how they opened the street and built the apartments facing onto the streets like a little community that they put right in the heart of urban Omaha. And that's part of its story. That's why it's significant because it still preserves that. The great thing is these uh, apartments were listed on the National Register and that opened the doors for the property owners to then pursue historic preservation tax credits, which they are now using to rehab all of these properties so that people can then move back in and turn it back into a functioning living community. So that's another great benefit of the National Register and being able to determine properties as historic and document their history so it facilitates you know, their re uh, refurbishment and rehabilitation so that they become useful again. So moving on, criteria B. So criteria B is association with a historically significant person. This one is a uh, bit more specific when it comes to determining significance for a property because it's not sufficient that a individual was born somewhere or they died in a property. For a property to be listed under an association with a significant person, that place should be where that person had their productive life, where they did the things that make them as an individual historically significant. So, for example, this is Willa Cather's house down in Red Cloud, Nebraska. So she lived here in her teenage years um, which initially is like, oh, but she didn't really do anything. I mean, she was a writer, but she wrote from New York. And, you know, but her stories were set in the place of her childhood. And this house features prominently in her novels. And therefore, that provides that direct association with Willa Cather and what made her significant, what made her a Pulitzer Prize winning author. So actually, we've got most of Webster County listed. <laughs> down there in Nebraska for association with Willa Cather because she wrote so much and so much survived down there that you can go down there and really experience it and be in her novels. An example closer to home is this one. This is the General George Crook House on, you know, Fort Omaha on the north side of the city, so the counterpart to this school. Um, and this one's associated with General Crook, who was instrumental in the uh, conflicts with the Native Americans and the attempts to resolve those and, you know, the military uh, expeditions out here in Nebraska. And so this house was built for him when they established Fort Omaha. So as a historically significant individual, he did his work out of this house and therefore that lead, uh, lends significance to the property. This house, this is actually in Norfolk. Nebraska. This is Johnny Carson's boyhood home. So, you know, Johnny Carson of Tonight Show fame. This is an example of a property that we could not list under criteria B. Number one, Johnny Carson didn't live there while he was host of the Tonight Show. So, it's not part of his productive life. The other thing is that you can't really tell from the photo, but several years ago, someone lost control of an SUV and drove right through the front of this house. And so that porch and all of that at the front of the house is actually non-historic. It was built within the last couple of years. So even if Johnny Carson had lived there while he was host of The Tonight Show, we would have a lot of trouble listing the house because so much of it was reconstructed using modern materials and the design is just a little off. Um, but still, it's, a, it's an interesting place. Um, and that just shows the, 
you know, the, the strictness when it comes to association with a person, because if not, we would be listing every other place. Oh, this person lived there for a year, and this person, you know, was born there and such. So we'll move forward. So criteria C, design, construction, this is the architecture bit, right? So we have individual examples of good architecture. This is Barker Building in downtown, a very good example of the Gothic revival style applied to uh, commercial buildings in the 1920s. So, and then this is a historic photo. And you know, outside of the bottom, right, where the storefronts, where we would expect to see change over time, the rest of the building essentially maintains its appearance and you know, it's listed under criteria C for its architectural significance. We also have works of a master. So this is the Mary Rogers Kimball house, if I remember correctly, the mother of Thomas Rogers Kimball, the you know, na native born Omaha architect. Um, and this is an example of a master work. This is you know, his highest or amongst his highest work. And therefore, it is eligible for listing under criteria C for its architecture. But then we start moving towards representative examples. This is, um, oh geez, that name escapes me. But the important thing is, is its design. Another architect design house, but it's representative of the prairie style of architecture as practiced here in Nebraska. And then moving further along, we have these types of representative examples. This is the Minnelusa neighborhood, which was listed for its amazing collection of early 20th century bungalows and other types of craftsman style houses. And we use architecture a lot when we're designating historic districts, especially when we have ensembles such as the Minnelusa neighborhood. So, and the great thing is, you know, 50 years ago is 1965. So now we're getting to list all the post-war stuff. So down in Lincoln, we actually got a post-war ranch house neighborhood listed on the National Register. This is Park Manor. So if you guys know of any really good collections of ranch houses that were all built at the same time, let us know, because we're looking for that to list, because we got to recognize that that stuff is becoming historic, and there's attention being paid to it, and it's actually you know, being threatened due to redevelopment is people are like, oh, that's not historic. I grew up in that house. How can that be historic? <laughs> it's like, no, this, this was groundbreaking. This was a complete revolution in how people lived. And we have to recognize that. Um, so we're looking for tons of stuff uh, in, from the 1950s and 1960s. So that, that's very basic overview. I mean, uh, we've got, over 11,000 properties listed here in the state of Nebraska in total in historic districts and individual listings. And so I could show you pictures all day, but we have to move on to integrity, telling that story. And so, I like this little place. This is a post office for Memphis, Nebraska. Relatively intact. So it's, you would think, oh, this is a great example of something that we could list on the National Register, right? Representative of small town life out in rural Nebraska. The problem is, though, is that it has lost integrity. And the integrity that it's lost is of location and setting because it's been moved from the former site of Memphis, which doesn't exist anymore, out to Wahoo in Saunders County, in Saunders uh, County Historical Society. So they moved to preserve it, which is great, but buildings don't exist in isolation, right? They, whether they want to or not, speak to their surroundings, to their location, right? And its significance is, you know, tied very closely to location and setting. And when you move a building, you break those ties and it becomes much more difficult to really share its significance. So moved properties are really difficult to list. For example, this house. This is Grand Victorian Mansion out in Fremont. And this house was also moved. So this house was moved in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. I forget the exact date. It was moved to save the house. Now, I show this because for every rule, there is an exception. And we can argue for significance. In this case, it's architectural. So architectural significance can stand alone even when it's been moved. 
And so we can work within a lot of these parameters to recognize historic properties and get them listed. And you'd be surprised how many houses move out here. I mean, they, they move around about as much as the old buffalo herds did. <laughs> Other integrity issues, again, materials. We're looking at materials. We're looking at design. So these houses are actually in the historic district, so we can give them a little bit more leeway. But if we were trying to list them individually, we wouldn't be able to because we've got vinyl on the right. We've got fake stone on the left. And you know, you may not may think, oh, but it's just you know vinyl siding. I mean, how can that be? But siding speaks to technology. It speaks to how people built their houses. You know, a lot of times the houses in the early 1920s were bought through catalogs. You'd order them from Sears Roebuck or you know Montgomery Ward or the Aladdin House Company, and the materials that they're made out of and the design all speaks to that house's origin. And when you lose that, you lose part of the story. So that's why we're always looking for materials and design. This is another example of a property that the integrity has been compromised. It was a, it's a um, church up in northeastern Nebraska. Neat little you know, country church that you'd find Gothic Revival wood um, with its spire and such. But the problem is, is that, well, it had to be modified. And we understand that, but um, you know, this is how it looked like historically. And you can see that if we look at the previous image, that front extension, which is understandable that they would need to modify their church over time, does detract from its ability to tell its story as a unified whole, as an expression of this Gothic revival. So we look at everything, though, and, and that's why we try to collect as much information as possible so that we can explain away as much of the integrity as we can. But there are still basic standards that we have to meet. This is the last one that I'm going to show you. This is a general store in Weston, Nebraska. So again, Saunders County. Doesn't look like much from the exterior, right? It's just white clabbered, some neat little pediments over the windows and bracketing under the cornice and the parapet. But the cool thing is, is that we don't just look at the outside of these buildings, right? We look at the insides, and that's really dark, but, you know, you can come up to my table in the back with the Historical Society and all of my colleagues, and I'll pull it up on my tablet, and you can see a better picture of this interior. It's like traveling in time to the 1890s. All the original woodwork was there, all the shelves, the drawers, the sliding ladder that they used to get up to the high shelves. They even had their original iron safe in this property. It really felt like you were traveling back in time. And so while from the exterior it didn't look like much, this is what, like a geode, really. And it just shows the, the, the gems are hidden out there and why we have to research and visit these sites and look at everything so that we can get that full story so that we can determine them as historic. And this building was listed uh, last year, about summertime is when the Park Service finally got back to us for its architectural significance as representative of, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century general stores and for its association with the development of the village. This is the only general store left in the town um, as an original building. All the other ones burned down or were irrevocably changed. They had six general stores at their height in the population of only 500. So it was a very significant community. So that's the brief overview of what makes properties historic, right? We look at those three broad categories, age, significance, and integrity. And we work with people. You guys can submit information to us, and we can do determinations of eligibility and advise on it. Um, for more information, feel free to contact me. I've got my contact information up here on the screen. Um, you can also visit the Park Service's website. They have tons of great information on there as well. And of course, we're, um, again, here at the back, and we have information on the National Register, on our survey programs, and everything else that's related to that. So thank you.